Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Really excited to be talking about cataloging and navigating consciousness. We have the Qualia Research Institute team joining us. Hello guys. Hello. Hi Alan. Hello everyone, hello, welcome back. This is our third episode with Quality Research Institute. Very excited, you guys are doing some of the most important work in neuroscience and consciousness today, and I'm very excited to have you guys back. This time we have Romeo joining us as well. Very excited to have you on. And we have Kenneth and Quinton joining us as well. Hello, hello. And Andres and Mike, of course, from the previous episodes, as you guys know. All right, so let's jump into things with understanding what it means to even explore the state spate of consciousness in the first place, to see this beautiful catalog of what is possible with state spaces of consciousness. And we have great graphics <laughs> as we go through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, this graphic is actually pretty pretty illustrative. So that's, uh, that's what's called the uh, color space, uh, CLAB specifically. So basically, what you can do is use combinations of light, so like for example, you know, a red, a green, a uh, blue light uh, with different like amplitudes, different energies, and uh, see uh, basically how much you need to change the lights for a person to experience what's called a just noticeable difference cool. in their experience of color, right? So it's kind of you're comparing two side by side two colors, and it's like, are they exactly the same, or they're subtly different? And if they're subtly different, you 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 count that as a unit a unit of a just noticeable difference. Whoa. And if you start using that as your ruler, it's kind of like, oh, you use the just noticeable difference as kind of a, a ruler, and you start to kind of like pin all of the values of experience that way. Uh, in the case of color, you end up with that three-dimensional space, basically has three dimensions. It has the blue-yellow axis, the red-green axis, and it has like the brighter and darker axis. Um, and it's Fabulous that it, it turns out to be a Euclidean 3D space. It could have been different. Uh, the paradigm doesn't impose a Euclidean geometry to it. The Euclidean property seems to be kind of a, a, an intrinsic feature of the state space of color. But this is just, just with color. In principle, you can do this with uh, flavors and smells and sense of touch and yes. uh, emotions. And you can basically generalize it in order to make a, a map of all types of uh, quilia, uh, quilia varieties. Basically, a, a quilia variety is a type of, uh, of quilia, type of consciousness. Where like, for example, a quilia variety could be the, the variety of color. This would be the state space of color. You could also have the state yes. space of you know, emotions and, and sense and textures. Yes. And I think like the, the next slide actually might be a, it's kind of like a good uh, sure. example of the state space of emotions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, if you, if you try to kind of like Rage, map them out. terror. <laughs> Yeah, grief, sadness, right, ecstasy, interest, uh, optimism, ecstasy, yeah, yeah, love. yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, they're all related in interesting ways. And the question is, how do you put them in a map so that their relationships um, in how they feel are, in a sense, encoded in the geometry of that map? Yes. Uh, I mean, as I said, like in the case of color, you can have a 3D Euclidean space. For emotion, is more complicated. You may need something like a hyperbolic space. You, you, you can get away with uh, Euclidean space for some things, but not for everything. Okay, so let's start unpacking this. So one of the things that I think is really relatable right there off the bat is when we see color. So we see uh, one shade of blue and then we juxtapose it with another shade of blue. And we, we don't, let's say we, if it's no units of difference, then we believe that the state space of, space of consciousness is the same, if it's mm -hmm. no units of difference. But if there is a single unit of difference or 10 units of difference, which you're trying to measure with like this ruler mm -hmm. that you're describing in the space, then, then you could say that the state spate of consciousness changes in the mind. And then is there then a, if you move only one unit versus if you move 10 units, mm -hmm. would there be a more, like a more subtle, smaller change for one unit and a little bit bigger change in the state space for? Yeah, I, I would, I, would uh, I mean, kind of like a worded as by changing uh, your consciousness, you're accessing different regions of the state space of consciousness. In some sense, the state space of consciousness never, never changes. It just is, it's kind of like the universal map of all possible experiences. But yeah, if you just take your experience and you just modify one shade of color in one piece of your visual field, mm -hmm. that would be making one step in that very high dimensional state space of consciousness. 
You can do much more radical transformations, of course, if you change okay. the entirety of your visual field, or you know, you change your experience or state of consciousness. You would be moving much further. But yes, but in a sense, the state of consciousness never changes. Is a feature of the universe. Okay. Yes. And then now um, we gave the example of color as part of a visual um, input stream. Then we started giving this massive amount of emotions that different people can feel. There's so many other ones of these. Um, so scent is another one. So you have to catalog the state space for scent, then yes. catalog the state space for taste yes. and for touch and for audio <laughs> um, and for all of these emotions and, and visions that we, what we talked about. And then you have to, if someone is experiencing two of these different, uh, of maybe a visual and, a, and a, an auditory or a visual and a taste at the same time, I mean, this gets super complicated super quick with the state space of consciousness. So yes. you like do you silo off the state space of consciousness for all these different sensory inputs, and then you also try and figure out when two of them work together or when four of them work together. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's what, what it might be called kind of a combinatorial explosion as, as soon as yeah. you start introducing more qualia varieties. And, and yeah, the, the truth seems to be that there's like some constraints between them, um, but they're, they're definitely not intuitive. Uh, you definitely have, uh, you know, people with synesthesia, for example, who naturally are able to bind together, for example, uh, sensations of sound together with sensations of color, which is something that most people can't. And that is also, you know, a component of the status of consciousness, is which of the qualia varieties can be bound together in your experience. And uh, that's another kind of like area to explore, like basically what is the, the, the space of possible ways of binding different qualia varieties. I mean, we humans are kind of have a natural or like a typical way of binding it, which seems to be evolutionarily advantageous. But in, in some sense, uh, we could say that we are all synesthetic. It's just that we are basically experiencing an evolutionarily advantageous type of synesthesia. And then is within, um, if we can get at least, I think, more people to try to be aware of how a different stimuli is then uh, causing us to, uh, them to have a specific state space of consciousness. So as long as we're becoming more conscious of, okay, a certain stimuli is, have, is, is a certain state space of consciousness. You know, when I feel good, it's a certain way. When I feel bad, it's something else is state space here. When I see blue, certain thing. When I see red, certain thing. When I t smell something, certain thing. So if you can at least start getting people to become more conscious of that, I think that gets the catalog more and more. Um, and then do we have another um, asset with, uh, with this? <laughs> I mean, that gets into the navigation. Okay, let's, component. beautiful. Let's shift right into navigation then. So we explained the catalog. So let's talk about navigating <laughs> between, because usually it's kind of like we're just going through and then all of a sudden we become happier or we smell something or we taste something, yeah. touch something. I'll, I'll just briefly mention the slide and then somebody Kay. else should, should jump in. But it's a, uh, what that slide represents. Just talk about the effort. Yeah, yeah, it's the, uh, this is from research I did in uh, grad school, uh, which was mapping out the transition probability between different emotions. So we took like 170 emotions and we tracked, you know, massive amounts of people. We ended up having like more than a million data points about how people transition from one emotion to, to the next. Yes. We would build models of like, given your s sequence of previous emotions, what other emotion you're likely to go to in the future. And with this kind of map, you find fascinating features of, of the navigation space because it turns out that there's, for example, these gateway emotions. Mm -hmm. Like for example, feeling hopeful, feeling relieved. Th those are like, it, it's not just kind of the sensation of, of a good or like your positive valence, if you feel hopeful or you feel relieved, that's a lot of information about where you were in the past and mm -hmm. where you're moving towards. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of like all of these topology as well of the gateways emotions, attractor emotions, emotions that basically are reflectors that they don't, for example, feeling tired. It doesn't matter in what region of the state space of consciousness you are, what emotions you were in. Most people feel tired at some point in the day. Um, not everybody, but most people. Tired is not a very high information uh, emotion, but hopefulness is a very high information mm -hmm. emotion. It tells you a lot about the trajectory mm -hmm. of the person. Whoa, yeah, this is huge. So it's <laughs> harder to get from something that's like an edge point uh, past like cheerfulness or excitedness 
to uh, something that's like annoyed or yeah. so it's harder to get from edge point to edge point because usually you have to go through these main center yes. gateway points. Yes. Then you can gain more information from certain um, points uh, about trajectory and paths than yeah. you can about other ones. It's kind of like a map of how to navigate it too. Okay. Yeah, it's like if, if, you, either you're, if you want to go to a very different emotion, you know, it's like what, oh, yeah. you know, empirically, what, are, what is like the typical transitions between emotions that will get you there? Yeah, that's cool. It's uh, also very important to note that some of these experiences, some of these emotions are more pleasant than others uh, by, by far. Yeah. And uh, part of navigation or part of sort of mapping is understanding this and understanding that um, a good map tells you where the good places to go uh, are as well. Uh, in, in the Middle Ages, uh, allegedly, uh, this might be uh, true or, or just a story, but um, in these old maps, uh, they had uh, marked here be dragons, mm. where people went and uh, didn't come back from, or there were <laughs> big troubles. Yeah. And uh, this is, I mean, yeah, in terms of mapping consciousness, we are absolutely in the early days here. Uh, but yeah, there are bad places in the state space of consciousness, and we need navigational principles in order to uh, understand where not to go. And uh, I, I feel that's a core part of this research. There be dragons in anxiety and depression yeah. and suicide. Yep. There be dragons. There <laughs> be evil forces. <laughs> so how do we avoid, avoid or, that, or yeah. kill the dragons? Yeah. How do we navigate away from yeah, that state space, yeah, by cataloging and then helping people move with little dissonance in those directions, okay. Other thoughts on navigation from you guys? Yes. Um, sort of, as, as Mike was alluding to, I think that having a map of the state space of consciousness also allows us to compare experiences um, in terms of their valence. So like, for example, um, one of the worst experiences known to humans is a cluster headache, um, which is an extremely, extremely severe uh, headache, uh, often rated a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale. So um, being able to quantify the valence, the negative valence associated with those kinds of experiences and comparing them to others allows us to determine um, which experiences are the ones that we want to avert the most. Yeah, sure. um, yeah and I think that uh it also allows us on the other side of the equation to say there are probably states of consciousness which no one has ever experienced over the course of human history, um, which would be really great to explore. Um, and having this map would allow us to, in a principled way, sort of know what direction we're going in, have a, a north star of positive valence. And uh, yeah, I think that's like something that we could definitely explore further too. <laughs> Damn, yeah, from the worst headaches in the world to those states of consciousness that have not even been explored that are extremely positive. Yeah, and there may be a very simple set of equations that describe how to get from that between those two points. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. yeah, just in general, a lot is at stake in figuring this out. Yeah. For hope and hopefully in forms that are uh, decentralized open source and loving compassionate ways and not yeah overly like manipulative cor corrupt yeah yeah ways yeah Romeo thoughts on catalog and navigating feeling good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they covered it <laughs> all right beautiful so um, what does it mean um, to have no dissonance in between the navigation of the state space of consciousness. Uh, so this leads into this uh, theory of emotional valence, that uh, this theory of what makes an experience good and what makes an experience bad. And so uh, Kiura's hypothesis here is called the symmetry theory of valence. And it's this idea that if we have a mathematical representation of what it feels like to be you, Alan, or what it feels like to be me, Mike, uh, that if we, the, the pleasantness or unpleasantness of that experience uh, should somehow be encoded into this mathematical object, this mathematical representation. 
and we we believe the uh, the encoding is in this object's symmetry. So uh, so more symmetrical with the states of consciousness that are really pleasurable, and less symmetrical with the headache. Yes, yes, and a uh, kind of a simple way to put this is harmony in the brain feels good, mm -hmm. dissonance in the brain feels bad. And is this true that the extreme headache states are like extremely uh, dissonant? Uh, that's a hypothesis. Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's a uh, kind of like a lot of like lines of evidence pointing towards it. Not specifically for cluster headaches that hasn't been studied in, in that way. But uh, when it comes to like all sorts of perceptual artifacts that come from like negative states of consciousness and how to induce them, yeah, there's kind of a suggestion that it has to do with uh, this concept of like roughness and dissonance. We actually have a, an example over there. Uh, okay, the next I mean, it's, it's actually not completely... Oh, this one, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, well, if you look at uh, the, the spectrum, there's a spectrum picture, right? Yes, that one. Okay. That's the, that's the spectrum of the BART. Um, I think, I, I believe, like, between 24th Street and Mission and, and Balboa Park. One of the most unpleasant sounds known to man. Oh, it's the high-pitched screeching noise when the... Yeah. It's, it's, and, and it's... It's, a, it's kind of high pitch. I mean, it's, it really has like, it's horrible component to between like 400 hertz and 500 hertz with some like upper registers as well of dissonance. But um, yeah, I think it's uh, being played at the, at the moment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's playing it, yeah. You turn it up. No, we, but you, I but can, we can hear it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's good, it's good. I think, I think you played the, the bad part. I think, I think we're good. Thank you. Yeah. The, it, yeah it's so, so it's a, I mean, it's it's a very very straightforward example of mm. how mm. a physical process that almost maximizes roughness can really harsh your mellow. I mean, it can. I mean, it's really a boss kill to to yeah. be in the bar. Like you're having fun with your friends, and all of a sudden these like incredible, yeah, incredible. Sc and uh, you know, a lot of people would be very puzzled about like, hey, like, why is this so bad? And that's like something that we are trying to answer. Uh, we've been developing basically algorithms that can take sounds like that and say, yeah, that's really horrible for, for a number of good reasons, uh, having to do with like the mathematical roughness of it, uh, the lack of invariance and symmetry. Okay. And uh, I mean, I, I would add that, I mean, hacking your emotions through sound is one of the most straightforward ways. Mostly because the, the number of pre-processing steps between auditory stimuli and brain state are very few, as opposed to, for example, pre-processing between uh, visual stimuli and brain state. So auditory stimuli, the shape of it, is going to be very related to the actual shape of the brain state that is triggered by, by it. So in a sense, kind of like the, the, the structure of a sound is going to be kind of a window into, um, into how it's going to affect the structure of your brain state. You can tell a lot about what brain states cool. are good or bad based on the structure of the sound that triggers good or bad feelings. Okay, and then what would then, <clears throat> if this is on the side of um, extreme uh, dissonance, and you could be in a very symmetrical state and then experience a super dissonance, and then that you could map, you know, how that actually affects someone's state space consciousness. What would be an example of the most symmetrical states? Well, in, <coughs> in music, there's definitely a lot of examples. I mean, not, not to sound all, all new age, but uh, Enya, for example, uh, if you run it through uh, the, the sort of software we're developing, it comes out as like very, very, very consonant, very, very, very symmetrical over time. I mean, like the sound engineering involved in like Enya songs is kind of really hitting the spot when it comes to like maximizing consonants and like all of these like reverb effects as well. Uh, but for Enya. Enya, yeah. N E N Y A. E N Y A. Yes. Enya. You never heard of Enya? Enya. A boy, a boy's gotta you know dive into other state spaces of consciousness. Obviously. But I mean, for example, like Buddhist singing bowls, as well. Those are like highly, highly consonant. Oh yeah. Analyze them. Yeah. And generally speaking, the chorus, the chorus part of songs tends to be very much in the direction of very high consonants, which is kind of like the part that tends to be the most hedonic of a song. The reason why songs are not just chorus is because that would get boring. 
Mm. And uh, basically, if you trigger boredom, then that will itself mm -hmm. cause a little bit of dissonance. You will fail to appreciate it. But if it's like dosed high amounts of consonants, consonants. like in the chorus of a song, then you can really get into it. Okay, interesting. <laughs> and just to set the frame, uh, we're working on ways to evaluate the, the consonants, the harmony in sounds, uh, as well as the dissonance with the eye toward if we can do it to sounds, there is also a method uh, to do it to brains, to actually evaluate in a precise mathematical sense how much harmony is in a, a brain state. And you could hypothetically imagine a world in which the BART would sound very consonant um, if you properly employed some of these algorithms that, you're, that we're developing. Um, I think kind of an important question here that a lot of people ask, similarly to can we feel good all the time, is well, if we need these, if we only have these pockets of consonants in popular music, um, is it required for us to have the dissonance in between those pockets of consonants in order for the sound to be pleasurable? Um, and our, our contention is that you don't necessarily have to employ dissonance in order to achieve contrast. Um, and so I think that's an important thing for people to understand too, is that you don't necessarily have to suffer in order to appreciate the contrast of feeling good. Mm -hmm. You can sort of start at zero and go to infinity rather than having negative infinity to positive infinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 one's, that one's really important. Actually, one of the, I think, things that have, has been in debate um, <clears throat> in the last couple of years with our, with our friends has been that, um, do we really need uh, to experience suffering in order to uh, understand what is on the positive infinity side of things to be able to actually have something to contrast it with to be grateful for and stuff and the, potentially one of the hypotheses is that we, we don't that there's no. so many other <laughs> yeah. yeah the the frame i would offer is that empirically human brains seem to kind of be built this way that we tend to oscillate between uh, suffering and pleasure, and uh, there does seem to be some some useful thing we as humans get from that. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be a law of the universe that you have to suffer to feel good. That there is this uh, hedonic balance, and um, presumably we could, if we're if we're making a new organism from scratch, we wouldn't have to program in that the organism would have to suffer. Okay, and let's, um, on a little bit more on this symmetry theory of valence, um, let's explain more about how exactly uh, we can do things like um, potentially have an, uh, a, a, a mathematical representation of a state space of consciousness that is symmetrical. Yeah, I think the next slide, potentially. Okay, cool. uh, maybe that. That's this one? Yeah, well, this, this kind of like illustrates, um, well, it's meant, meant to be a video, but oh, otherwise. Yeah, Ron, Ronnie will play it. Oh, okay, no, no problem. Okay, it's going. Oh, cool. sweet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so those are the, the, the harmonic states of a, a plate. This is called a Cladney plate. Basically, um, if you make it vibrate uh, with like a speaker, for example, yeah. at a certain frequency. Cymatics. Yeah, cymatics, exactly. It's gonna basically lock in into a nearby resonant mode. And the really cool thing is that there's only an integer number of possible resonant modes. There, there's, there's not an infinite number of shapes you can make. Oh. Um, and the reason why is that there's only a certain number of ways in which kind of this mechanical wave can fit an integer number of times in the shape of the plate. Um, so in a sense, you can like discretize. This uh, is already getting very technical. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay, as well. All the, right. Explain yeah. this. So, so, you, so we're saying that the amount of symmetrical states are limited. The the number of resonant modes. Resonant modes, modes. Are, are limited, and at any, any given point in time, you're experiencing a weighted sum of many resonant modes. Okay. Basically, the the vision is uh, the equations that tell you what shapes form on this plate. Yes. This. Uh, so you basically sprinkle salt or sugar on these uh, gladly plates and then uh, you, you can kind of visualize the waves. And the same equations which predict the shapes at different frequencies 
are the same equations we're applying to the brain. Okay, so if I'm at 345 hertz and that's making a symmetrical uh, state for me, um, that may be through a process of something like I'm meditating or I'm experiencing a form of symmetry of flow state or listening to the course of the music or whatever it may be. Right. And so then the same way that you visualize salt or, or sugar in a symmetrical state on the could be the same way that that same mathematical equation could be of what and so I'm trying to keep that state I'm trying to hold on when people get lost in their flow state or deep in their meditation that they're just mm -hmm. extending and extending that period and then uh, so they've basically been having that same equation happen for a period of, of time right I mean in a sense uh, it's kind of like the higher the valence which is the, the, the more pleasant the, the state is it's kind of like a function of the total consonants. Like it's basically the, the, the way in which those harmonics are interacting to the get together. Are they interfering in a, in a positive way or are they interfering in a destru destructive way? And one key there is that in a sense like the, the richness of your experience um, would have to do with how many of those harmonics you're able to fit in a consonant way. I mean, a, there's a difference between just hearing you know, a melody played with like two or three notes in a piano versus a whole orchestra. And there's like a, a whole, you know, art is a whole art and science to how to feed a whole orchestra of instruments into something that sounds good. When you have like all of these different frequency channels and different timbers and different ways of softening the sound. And likewise, like a peak experience is not just a necessarily a pure, simple, you know, resonant mode, but it's more kind of this assembly of resonant modes that fit really well together. And this would look a little more scattered if it was in a dissonant state. There yes. wouldn't be any symmetry that right. was rough. It would, it would look rough, unbalanced, and constantly changing. Okay. And yeah, just to offer a little context here. So that's what suffering is. Rough, unbalanced, <laughs> and constantly changing? Yeah. Is, kind of like turbulence. Tur yeah. Kind of like turbulence. Turbulence. Oh. Right. Yeah. Turbulence yeah. is a oh, good metaphor for this. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Shinzen Young talks about turbulence as, mm. as suffering in, in his book. Um, and just to, to offer some context mm -hmm. here, this is based off the work of uh, a neuroscientist uh, by the name of Selen Atasoy. Uh, mm -hmm. She's at Oxford, and uh, the paradigm is called connectome specific harmonic waves, <laughs> and it's a way of uh, interpreting uh, neuroimaging, uh, existing techniques, um, fMRI, DTI, MRI and adding it together to figure out the brain's natural resonances, just like a, a guitar or a piano or a wine glass has these natural resonances. This is a way of um, measuring them in a brain. And what we're doing is we're building on top of this, uh, analyzing this, this data for harmony, uh, basically. And then the, the idea is then that if you can then uh, start doing things like um, conducting uh, uh, like fMRI scans of symmetrical states of consciousness, then you can start uh, cataloging. And when you can start cataloging, and you can make that that beautiful representation. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think one very very important frame here is what you can measure, you can manage. And if this is a tight proxy for how pleasant a brain state is, then it lets us uh, understand if a brain, if, if a, a person is in pain, if they are suffering, it allows us to pinpoint where is the suffering coming from? Because we can look at the mathematics of the, the frequencies and the dissonance and say, oh, it's this specific harmonic. Uh, it's uh, the frequency has drifted or it's oscillating in a strange way or, or whatnot, and um, it allows us to uh, calculate the turbulence that's occurring. Right, right, yeah. and figure out how to fix it, basically. Yeah. Okay, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure, I was just going to mention uh, we've talked a lot about human brains here, but this paradigm could also be applied to non-human animals as well, um, and it could be a really interesting way to, to directly scientifically determine whether or not animals are suffering because I think that is a question that is on a lot of people's minds and there are some people who think that non-human animals are not capable of suffering and this might be a, a way to determine that they actually are um, and even even further in the future maybe it's something that could be used on 
on other other types of brains on, on artificial intelligence, for example, to determine what what state is that AI in, or what state is this animal in, and how do we fix that for them in addition to ourselves? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's also even even the even like a plant um, for if the plant is is having insects eat it or isn't having the right nutrients in the soil or sunlight and it's starting to die. I mean, is that then an expression of, of consciousness dying? Right. Hard, <laughs> hard to say at this point. Hard to say at this um, point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say all that, the way uh, up to the AI. Yeah. This method could be applied to literally any organi organism with neurons, uh, assuming that there's a, some proxy relationships. And plants have only cells. They don't have neurons. That's Plants right. have only cells, but you can see a stress response happening in the plant when it gets. Yeah. Yeah. Not, so. not to get too, okay. uh, too academic okay, here, yeah, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just throw this. This is not necessarily a QRI line. This is more uh, an argument by David Pierce. Uh, we've, we've talked briefly about it, but one reason why plants are not as, I mean, they could be conscious, we don't know, uh, but definitely there's the, the purely physiological component that the cells are divided by thick cellulose walls. Mm. So whatever is the, the mechanism of action for binding, for neurons actually talking to each other yes. and, and being able to synchronize with each other, that doesn't seem physically possible between the cells of a plant. Okay. But who knows? Okay, so it's potentially how neurons are able to communicate with each other with more thin the transmitters, that, that type of the transmission yeah. that makes it, yeah, versus the thick walls of plant cells. Okay. So on the non-human animal uh, aspect that um, in humans we see uh, there's this strong factor of uh, default hedonic set point. Some people go through life just happier than others. Some people have very high hedonic set point. Some people have very low hedonic set point. And uh, this, is, this is very interesting that even within humans you find an enormous range of, of hedonic set points. And uh, it's interesting to think about if you see this amount of variance within humans, how much variance will there be between species? And maybe it turns out it's just pretty fantastic to be a dog. Yeah, or dolphins <laughs> are just constantly <laughs> ecstatic. Yeah. Right. Or something. Right. Yeah. And maybe it's just terrible to be a giraffe or, or a mouse. Yeah, yeah, someone that's constantly in fear of being consumed by another animal. Yeah, something sure. like that. Yep. So in the sense it could move the, the whole field of uh, understanding um, non-human sentience or non-human, mm. I guess, wild animal suffering uh, or cool. whatnot, yeah, to a more quantitative basis. Yeah. Like to be able to say that a specific animal has a, has a tendency to move towards specific state spaces of consciousness and other ones have different tendencies. That's really cool stuff too. Now, so people need to help fund you guys so you can do the fMRI uh, scans of symmetry and dissonance. That's the next, that's the big stuff. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's a, what would, we would describe it as kind of a very high information experiment. Uh, I mean, we are currently collecting what you might describe as kind of like low information or medium information experiments, um, which in a sense like they add up and of course if you have enough weak evidence, that definitely builds a very strong case. But uh, in science usually how paradigms change is when somebody makes a really weird prediction and then they actually go ahead and test it and it turns out like yeah, the prediction is correct. Yes. And that's, that's one of the cases of, uh, for example, putting people uh, in fMRIs with MDMA and then computing the consonants of the brain harmonics. There's no other theory that is predicting that would have anything to do with pleasure and pain. So that's kind of like the case of really weird, really weird prediction, very high information if it turns out true. Um, that said, we are not completely constrained by that. I mean, the, the, the research we're aggregating uh, currently, it is building up the case over time. Um, but of course, we, we would love to just like, you know, jump to the, <laughs> cut yeah. to the chase and, yes, and yes. see what happens to in there. Test the hypothesis. Yes. Yeah, right away as soon as possible. Yeah, I could, uh, maybe if you go to maybe the, the last slide. The uh, very last one? Yeah, Are just to Buddha? kind of uh, yeah, okay. give, you, give you like an example of what we consider a moderate uh, evidence for the symmetry theory of valence. 
Um, it's moderate because it's through EEG. And of course, like, there's not a really great theory of what EEG is measuring. But if you interpret it through the light of connecting harmonics, this makes a lot of sense. So <clears throat> what this uh, is showing is, uh, OK, so like they, they basically took uh, EEG recordings, high quality EEG recordings of um, a person on 5-MeO DMT, which is described as one of the most uh, intense, but also most blissful and terrifying uh, states of consciousness. But basically, very, very, very high valence. The just God like molecule. God molecule. Yeah, basically, people rate it as like 10 out of 10 in the dimension of significance, as in it feels very significant. So clearly, uh, if there's like a signature of valence, you would expect to see it on 5-MeO DMT. And uh, what this research shows is that if you take the, the EEG signatures of a person on 5-MeO DMT, and you filter by the gamma band, and the gamma is usually associated with heightened states of consciousness, like orgasm, basically high arousal, high energy states. Once you filter uh, the EEG through the gamma band, and you start seeing the, the phase correlation between the different channels, you will see that on 5-MeO DMT, it just maxes out. Basically, all the channels are uh, in phase coherence. In some sense, you can almost think of it as like there's this 40 hertz vibration, uh, electromagnetic vibration throughout the entire brain in synchrony. And like, why would that be associated with a, a sense of profound uh, sense of significance if synchrony and symmetry didn't have anything to do with valence? Um, you could probably round it up with some other theories, potentially. But, and that's why this is not necessarily kind of the, the, the silver bullet. But we consider it like, yeah, a moderate piece of evidence. And uh, if we assemble enough of these, I think the case is going to be pretty strong. And yeah, back on the funding angle, uh, it's this question of um, finding uh, people who are very comfortable with weird <laughs> ideas and uh, potentially incredibly transformative ideas yes. that uh, have, have a, a solid rationale but are sort of outside the Overton window of what generally gets funded. So yeah. we're, we're always on the lookout for sort of high quality donors. This is complicated. What you were describing is extremely complicated. And yeah, to be able to take a high quality EEG recording and then to be able to just analyze the gamma and then to be able to take in, um, an analysis of uh, the hypersymmetry of, uh, it was a 10 on this, on, on uh, impact or what was significance. It? significance sense of yeah. significance sense of significance yeah, yeah 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 it's definitely true for a lot of the, the experiences romeo you're trying to go the whole show without talking i know <laughs> 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 any 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 inputs um, i mean they're all doing such a great job so i don't <laughs> you know, see the need to mess with perfection Okay, and um, a couple other uh, assets that I think we want to show. Can we show the one right after the cymatics, Ronnie? The one, um, like a couple assets back, just a couple, the very first white one in that row, um, in the row. Yep, yep, that one, yep. Yeah. So um, I just want to show these quick. Yeah, I think this is important. This is kind of like the, the catalog of the state space of consciousness. You can be extremely yeah. neutral, you can be extremely. These, w these would be uh, basically cataloging, I mean, how we were describing, you know, take the color. Uh, state space, right? Or, or take like the flavor state space. This would be basically getting at the root of the emotional state space. So this is when you'd be tasting something that's like really, I don't know, spicy, or I don't know, like ah, like what would be well, like, yeah, hurting sure. you a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure, like suffering. pain, pain, for example. Like when you, when you the, the, like when people <laughs> eat that hot sauce that, that like makes them cry. And yeah, like, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, sure. Or physical pain, or emotional pain. Basically, just like highly negative valence. Um, well, actually, yeah. What, what this suffering, is yes. okay. suffering. What this is describing is um, uh, kind of like a way of visualizing the dissonance between harmonics. Okay, so this is dissonance. These are each suffering. Right. Okay. These are each different harmonics. And uh, if you wanna explain the sure uh, harmonics, uh, the size of the bubble is kind of like the amplitude, how much energy each of these harmonics has, and then the arrows are basically whether they're like mutually consonant or dissonant with each other. And uh, I mean, in music, when you're analyzing the dissonance of like simple uh, instruments being put together, basically what you do is you compute the pairwise dissonance of all the pure tones in the spectrum. 
and that gives you kind of the global dissonance score, which uh, basically, yeah, can account for like subjective ratings of, of dissonance. Here is uh, kind of like taking the same idea, but applying it to brain harmonics. So you take like for every pair of brain harmonics, you see whether they're like dissonant or consonant. You aggregate all the, all the dissonance, and that would be kind of a, a general measure of how bad the experience feels. Then you add up all the consonants, and that's kind of a general measure of how good it feels. Uh, anyhow, like that's what the, the, our theory is predicting, specifically. It gives you, so this is adding up all the, all the pairwise dissonance relations. This is the pairwise consonance relations, pairwise noise relations. And it gives you a position in a valence space. Essentially. Oh, okay, and one 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 more time um, for one more time again. Give that give that bit again with the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the the red is adding up all the pairwise dissonance relationships okay. between these natural brain harmonics. Okay. And you just aggregate them, so, uh, add them up, and then the blue is the pairwise consonant relationship, okay. Okay. and then this is the pairwise noise relationship. Gray ones. Okay. All right, all right. And it gives you, uh, if you sort of add them up, it gives you a position on this uh, state space. State that. space, okay. And yeah, for, just for clarity, that triangle, right? So like when people say like, are you feeling good or bad? Oftentimes people say like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the reason why is because usually typical emotions, typical, typical emotional states are mixed. You have, uh, for example, you're, you're at a concert, um, you're enjoying the music and your friends, but then like the speakers are not really good, and then like you also need to go pee, and you're kind of drunk, and like okay, this very <laughs> complicated mixed yeah. state. So that would be kind of like in the middle, right? It has like some positive valence components, some negative, and some neutral. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why, to, yeah, to an extent, like self-report is pretty difficult because Super it's so difficult. so mixed usually. Okay, because there's all these these pair, what you call them, pair pairwise pair relationships. pairwise relationships. Okay, and they're all kind of pulling a little bit on the neutral or on the pleasure or on the dissonance. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think a way to relate this to uh, the state space of color again, because I think that's one that's like pretty well understood by people, um, is one way to create colors is to create certain RGB values. Um, and so you sort of have like the red that's on a scale from 0 to 255, green scale from 0 to 255, blue scale from 0 to 255, and then you sort of mix different values of R, G, and B to get a certain color as an output. Mm -hmm. I think the metaphor kind of works here too, where you know yeah. you have these three values of constants, dissonance, and noise, and you're sort of mixing them to get a certain, not color, but certain emotional state. Um, and so I think that that's kind of a way to, uh, an okay metaphor for how Yeah, that's it. a good one. I like that one a lot. Yeah, that's one that people I think are really familiar with, yeah. Yeah, people know about color. That, that was a pretty good one, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and let's, um, let's wrap on this uh, point. I want to bring this up. So um, during the last talk that I went to that you guys were hosting, um, I really enjoyed this, that a lot of people um, are either kind of st stuck in their, own, in their own bodies, identifying with their own selves and nothing really outside of themselves. Uh, some people try and understand their whole like timeline all the way back to their past when they're born all the way to their future where they're trying to go so they kind of get it on the whole timeline scale and then this <coughs> and also <coughs> excuse me and also where the world is at as well in those um, periods of years as well so from like if you're born in 2000 until 2080 so um, that chunk of time versus this idea of like all that is or infinity or love or infinite consciousness there's so many ways to describe this god etc source and when one uh, potentially taps into things like these super symmetrical states um, that they uh, may experience uh, uh, it, that they may experience dives into all that is and so some people can trigger that just through breath and just by expanding themselves out as vast as the universe. And I think that's a very beautiful way to, to get there. And so this sounds it, sounds, it sounds great to be able to ebb and flow between all three of those. And that's something that um, I think was really beautifully said by you. You um, go ahead and yeah, explain that more to us. I like that a lot. Yeah, I mean, we, we do seem to kind of like come into this world with uh, implicit views of who we are, but they're like given by evolution. They're not necessarily true, they're just pragmatically useful. I mean, this sense of uh, you start existing when you're born, you stop existing when you die, is usually an unexamined assumption 
Of course, people tried to extend it and say, well, maybe you don't die really, you continue to exist as a soul after you, you die, or maybe you, there was a reincarnation. Most people still think of it as kind of just a, a single line, and you're in a sense like separate from the rest of the universe. But there's like alternative views that can be justified. There's this view uh, called empty individualism where you're just like this moment of experience. And in a moment, in, in a second, you're gonna be a different entity. <laughs> or rather, a different entity will inhabit your body because you were just that slice. <laughs> um, and then there's like this view called uh, open individualism, which is that we're all one consciousness. That like we are all kind of this meta meta organism looking at itself from different points of view. And uh, I think like really the, those are you can describe them also as like states of consciousness. Um, you can definitely in some states of uh, very neutral experience, you can just feel that you're just a time slice. A very classical way of feeling that we are all one consciousness is uh, in psychedelics and meditation. I mean, 5-MeO is a classic example of people. It really creates the feeling that you're all consciousness. Mm -hmm. And there's like this interplay between the information content of the experience and how cleanly defined you are. So like 5-MeO DMT or any of those like super symmetrical states, it's so symmetrical, so invariant, it contains close to no information. So there's, there's just not enough information to know who you are. <laughs> so you identify with the light of consciousness or the void or wow. universal mind. Yeah. I think like, a, yeah, that kind of a state and especially if you can like logically and, and precisely shift between those, mm -hmm. that's gonna be really important for like global coordination where you're gonna have like CEOs of companies or, or leaders of, of different countries identify with consciousness rather than with you know their cultural background or who they are or mm -hmm. then yeah i think like they can collaborate to basically raise the baseline of everybody it's a possibility yeah damn that's that that section right there is a whole nother conversation <laughs> in itself um all right so for uh those that uh um were watching we would love for you to give us your thoughts in the comments below in the episode let us know what you're thinking um check out the links in the bio to quality research institutes uh, website as well as um, the other resources that you find in the links below. Also, um, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support them, help them grow. Support Quality Research Institute, help them get um, funding for the um, research that they need to get done. Also, support simulation. Our links are below to our Patreon, PayPal, cryptocurrency links. Support us, help us grow. And share more content about this type of stuff with your friends, your families, coworkers, people online on social media about cataloging and navigating consciousness. Really get talking more about this. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you soon. Peace. Woo. <laughs>